Hi, this is Paul Byrell. I'm a, um, someone who has taught Tarot for almost 40 years, and I've written a book, and I enjoy working with the cards. We have um, someone in our community who isn't able to see the cards, and I'm going to start a series um, working with, uh, for reference, the cards that were illustrated by Pamela Coleman-Smith. And when I buy the great big deck, there's always a blank card. So I'm going, Marianne, I'm going to give you the blank card. And I'm going to start with the Major Arcana and describe the imagery on the card. And you can picture it on that one. Okay. So later when you do a Tarot layout, you can lay the cards out. Somebody can tell you which ones you've got. Mm -hmm. And you'll have a better sense of what, what they mean. Right. So the first card in the Major Arcana um, is card number zero, mm -hmm. and that's the full card. The full card, the way it was drawn, shows the very edge of a precipice. There's even a little ledge sticking out, so it looks very precarious. And with this, the figure, which is somewhat pretty androgynous, not somewhat, is standing there um, holding a flower in one hand, the other hand holds a long um, staff type shape. It's like a stick, but at the end of it is a small bag that has possession. So that's all he has. It's just what's in the bag. And very carefree, there's a, a wreath of perhaps bay leaves around the head and a, a plume sticking out. And up in the corner is the sun. And the precipice that, that this figure is on um, we see it in the foreground and far, far in the background are very tall mountains. And in between, it makes it very obvious, looking at this drawing, that it's a long ways down. Mm -hmm. um, and so what we know is that this is going to be stepping into the abyss, into the unknown. In the Tarot, though, these mountains in the background always show the mountains always indicate that the potential is there to achieve greatness, find wisdom. The goal um, is, is always going to be there, but it looks like it's pretty dangerous in getting there. And there's a little dog representing um, the person's faithful companions who are all nipping at his heels saying, you fool, what are you thinking of? But the reality with this is that is that there are times that we will take action which others might think foolish, but we have to trust in the unknown and step off into the abyss and we will end up safe, protected. Um, you know, it's a very positive card. Um, mm -hmm. Just stepping into the unknown like that. So that's the full card. Now erase your, there you go. And now it looks all white again. And card number one is the magician. The magician shows a figure which looks a little more male than female or a flat-chested female. I mean, it's just, again, androgynous. And the, the background is quite neutral. And then around the perimeter of the card, from up above, we see vines hanging down a ways and they're, they have beautiful flowers growing on them. And there are some vines down at the bottom with flowers and, and something that looks like a lily. Um, and the flower looks like a lily, but the leaves don't look like typical lilies. But so it's very fruitful, very, um, we see that when the flowers are blooming, it means they've been pollinated, they're opening, they're, they're, all this is ready to happen. Here we are in the midst of the wild, you know, the, the nature, and there's this very sturdy looking table. It's actually an altar and we know it's more than just a table because carved into the edge or painted are various symbols. Um, there's one for what looks like Aquarius. And so there are, there are magical symbols drawn on the, the edge of the table facing us. Laying on top of the table are four ritual tools for the four cards, the four suits. So there's a large staff a large sword, a chalice, a pretty tall chalice, and a round disc with, with a pentagram on it, a pentacle. 
The figure is behind the altar facing us, wearing a white robe, and over that there's a red open robe. And we can see that the white robe has some type of belt or cords, something tied around the waist. Um, above the head is an infinity symbol, right where the energy mm -hmm. would be going. And the one hand, the one arm is reaching toward the earth, sort of stretched out a little bit with the finger pointing down. The other is the hand is holding a small wand with a knob at each end. And that arm is up pointing to the sky. So the typically what this represents is the as above, so below mm -hmm. principle. But it's also a card that shows that this is a person who has training, who's able to make magic happen, um, who understands the values of each of those four suits. Because the suits, when we get to them, are about various types of behavior and ethics and things like that. There's the work ethic. There's the ways in which we communicate, the ways in which we learn to handle our emotions to be mature. The fact that the belt around his waist is almost like a snake holding its tail indicates that this may be a symbol of the fact that he's an initiate, certainly to be working with tools at this level. Um, this is somebody with magical training and balance and poise who's manifesting that pure energy up above the crown chakra of his head. Very good card. And it's really a card that indicates you've got confidence. This is now a time that you can act, that you can do things about, you can make it happen. Mm -hmm. um, and But it also, it also it wants you to be careful with the images that you're holding in your mind. Because the magician is a card of that mental ability. And so all of the tools and things that are there are simply to help him focus the mind. But so the energy is there, the magic is happening, and you want to make sure that you've got carefully chosen imagery going on in your mind, that you're not full of self-doubt or things like that. You don't want that amplified. Mm -hmm. So we'll move to the next card now. Number two. This is card number two. Now, it's always interesting because the magician has a name that implies ceremonial magic. Mm -hmm. And then this one is the high priestess, and the Wiccans always go crazy thinking she's the Wiccan. But he's out there in the midst of nature. She's sitting here in a very formal temple. There's a great big column, a pillar, on each side of her. Mm -hmm. One is white and one is black. And there's a big letter on each one. One has a J and one has a B. And those date back to biblical words, Boaz and Wachim. And they, for all practical purposes, those pillars represent the polarities. And she's balanced as the middle pillar sitting between them. Oh. So she's very reserved. She's dressed very formally. She's got a large, beautiful robe on. There's an equal arm cross over her heart. She has a very large crown. And although the background we would think would show a mountain, because this is a path to enlightenment, there's a, a screen, a, a piece of fabric hanging there so we can't see it. So the mysteries are still concealed at this point. Um, and on this fabric, we see pomegranates. So we know that she can take it there, but not as directly in a sense. So she still, she still deals with the mysteries. She's got a roll, a scroll, uh, a roll of paper, and it's got three, four letters showing. And sometimes there's a, you see people want to try to figure out what the word is because it starts out T-O-R-A, and then the rest of it's hidden behind her robe. So it could be Torah, or it could be Tarot. Um, but if it's Tarot, it's spelled wrong. I mean, it's yeah. sort of the letters are reversed. So, but it, 
So what that really represents, though, is that she has access to the mysteries. Mm -hmm. She's sitting on a throne which looks like no more than a, a large cubic block of marble. Um, and yet, she's very reserved, very formal, and there's a crescent moon down at her feet. Just a big, beautiful crescent moon um, sitting there. I'm not sure what it's made out of. It's probably got a hidden stand to keep it from tipping over because it's very nice. She's very um, formal. She is somebody who you don't approach lightly. She's not the kind of person that you would let your kids just climb up into her lap. Um, and she represents somebody you would go to for spiritual advice or training. Um, and she is a little, she might be thought of as aloof, but she's just very reserved, very removed from the world a little bit to do what she does. Mm -hmm. It's a, a, we're starting with such really great cards. The High Priestess, I think. I'm not sure if I remember to show them all. Um, this was the Magician. I'm not sure. I have a feeling that the camera might reverse the images, but that's all right. Card number three is the Empress. The Empress is one of those cards, there will be an Emperor. She's... Um, she's a married woman and, and she's honorable so mm -hmm. um, and she's sitting on a comfortable throne it's actually it looks like a, um, a sort of a lounge but there's big cushy pillows on it um, there's a, a round rolled pillow and fabric and the shield that's there is shaped like a heart with the planet Venus on it so in a good modern deck, she should look pregnant. Mm. So this is a very maternal aspect of the goddess, in a sense, of, of a feminine presence who's in a position of leadership. This is somebody that kids could climb up in her lap. Um, she's got a crown on her head filled with lots of stars. Um, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen stars. We can speculate, you know. Um, people who work with Tarot love to tell you what all these symbols mean. But the people who designed the deck did some writing. A.E. Waite did, he has a book on, on this design. Um, but Pamela Coleman Smith executed it. She's the artist and um, she's not with us. So some of the, some of the detail is, is also a mystery. She's wearing a beautiful white robe with red flowers embroidered on it, um, holding a small scepter, which would be the equivalent of a wand. It'd be in that family of tools. She's got that raised. Um, in the background, we have something very interesting because there are tall trees like a woodland, but then there's water that's coming around and at the edge of the card, we see that the water comes and there's a waterfall. So, what, and it's in the background behind her. Not terribly far, but but this implies that there's more to nature than just a two-dimensional reality here. Um, the sound of water flowing, the presence of of water being the carrier of dreams, the substance of the subconscious and imagination, all of that's there. And in the foreground, it looks like, I think of it as wheat growing because she represents fertility. You know, she's pregnant, she's carrying, um, the, the future is there represented by the card. She carries the future for their, their kingdom, their earldom, their whatever the country, whatever the land might be. And her partner is the emperor. She looks young and fruitful. He looks very old. Um, and the age difference is, is not, we can't assume because of the appearance. He's made to look old because he represents wisdom and experience. And he's sitting on a large throne that has ram's heads 
up on the corners of it and where his hands would rest on, on the armrests. He's got armor on and a red robe with dragons uh, on the shoulder and a long white beard, um, partly because he's at the top of the mountains. We see water flowing there in the background also, but the mountains in the background have no vegetation. That means he's above the tree line. Mm -hmm. So where is he and why is he there when she's pregnant and sitting down in the cushy green areas? <laughs> he's out there protecting and checking the borders and making sure that nothing comes in that would harm the people. Although she, even being pregnant, she could fight if she had to. We have to remember that royalty was always trained. And mm -hmm. um, yeah, so they're always quite a pair. They, they um, are visually are interesting because they look so different and yet they're, uh, they're a pair. When they bring a child into the world, for them they know that this child is really for the people. It's not like a typical couple mm -hmm. having children for themselves. They're, they're bringing an heir to the throne, somebody who will carry on all the work that they've done in their lifetimes and what they inherited. He's holding um, a scepter in one hand. It looks a little bit um, like it's an ankh, but it's, um, it's a long, straight, upright piece. Then there's it like a T, mm -hmm. and above that is a circle. Okay. In his other hand, he's got a round sphere. So you can make of those what you wish. Again, all of those symbols, they really, they imply knowledge, wisdom, power, ability. Um, you don't have to, and right behind his throne, we also see this water flowing at the base of the mountains. So between his throne and those mountains, which go up very high, is also water. So that implies that in his life, he has learned to have to be able to cross the abyss to get to where he needs to go. They are never not aware of each other. So even if you get one card in a reading, they would, they would, there's, there's still always a couple. Um, they would have a pretty psychic connection when he's out in the mountains at the perimeter. She would know if anything bad happens to him or if anything good happens. And he will, we assume he's going to be back before the baby's born. That's good. <laughs> card number five is one of the cards that when I do a workshop about good decks and bad decks and how to avoid bad decks, this is one of the cards to look at. Um, it's the Hierophant. It's a very misunderstood card. Some of the decks refer to it as the Pope. And in calling it the Pope, sometimes it's not very flattering. Mm -hmm. Some decks try to get rid of it completely, and they'll put sort of a pagan, druid-type person, you know. But but this card, now we've got someone sitting on a throne between two pillars. These pillars are really ornate. The throne is really ornate. The crown on this person's head is really ornate. And that's why people get confused. They think this card represents all of the things financial and power-wise that are wrong with major churches. Mm. Beneath his feet, sitting before him on the carpet, are two keys which are crossed, which re represent the ability to open the portals to wisdom. And then there are two men we see them just their shoulders and their heads, and their the top of their head has been shaved, you know the center part. So we know that they're part of a religious order. Mm -hmm. So what is the role of the hierophant? The hierophant's role is to preserve and maintain religion, even though the kings and queens may come and go. He knows that his job is to help his religion lasts beyond politics. He's the person who's likely to, to bless their babies, marry the couples, conduct the rites of passage when they die, um, put, them in, put, you know, be, put the crown on them in a ceremony, all of those things. 
And what we see that's so important are the, the tools that he has have to be larger than life. Mm -hmm. Because when he marries the couple, the king and the queen, or he puts the crown on their head, and he raises a chalice, if he's got an old chip pottery chalice he bought at a thrift sale, people would be horrified. I mean, this is why, why people get confused. Because of his prominence, he has to have things which are like in theater. They've got to be visible to the people who are at the back of a crowd of 500 people who are there to see what's going on for their land, their country. And they want their religion to look successful. Mm -hmm. It's very essential. Um, he is the person who can create clergy people. He's the person who, if need be, could probably initiate the high priestess if there was not a woman in her tradition. Um, it, it's just, it's a very important position. Um, so the, the, um, the things that we see that look like they represent wealth and, and um, wealth, I guess, wealth and artistic skill, the, the elaborate pillars, that's what we see in all religions when we go to the largest churches mm -hmm. and temples. And that's what we want to see. And somebody went to a great big cathedral in Europe, and they went inside, and they, you know, and they saw squalor. They'd be horrified. I mean, so that's that's what this card gets confused because this card says that that if it's talking about you, it's saying, you know, you better um, wear your good underwear because you're going to be in a position of spiritual prominence that that requires you to act on the behalf of the public in some way, or you might be consulting someone who's in this role. I mean, they can mean a number of different things, but mm -hmm. that's what this card represents a very important function in society. Okay. Another card that helps me know if the deck is good or not, card number six. Card number six shows um, nudity. Um, not very exciting nudity at all. There's a man standing on the Let's see if I'm behind the card, on the left side of the card, and a woman on the right side of the card. There's Each one has a tree. Mm -hmm. She's standing with a tree that's got um, fruit and leaves and a serpent coiled up around the tree. And he's standing by a tree that has what look like flames or, or flames of, you know, like tongues of fire, something very spiritual. And each tree is a very good tree. Between them, off in the distance, is a very tall mountain peak. One of the best. Um, even down toward the bottom, because up here on the top of the card uh -huh. is a winged creature. And right behind that creature is a very large sun. So... This card, unfortunately, is titled The Lovers. Um, and so the decks where they don't understand the tarot really well, what you see are cards that say, true love, happily ever after. This card is about how do you face choices? So if these people come together as lovers, each has their own way of doing things. So do I choose his tree or her tree? I've got two trees of knowledge. They're clearly not the same. And you can't use both, um, but you have to choose. Are we going to handle money the way she likes to handle money? Or are we going to handle money the way he likes to handle money? Are we going to, you know, it's, it's that. And that's what a relationship how you do in the beginning is you've got to sort out the entire value system. Mm -hmm. Nobody can win all the time. And this card says it doesn't really matter. They both have very solid value systems, but they're going to have to face choice. And once you face choice, don't second guess it. Don't spend the next 10 years going, you know, maybe if we chose them my way. This card can come up when somebody's looking for a job and they've got more than one option. And this card says it doesn't matter, but you have to make a commitment to it and choose that job and that will be the right one as long as you don't sit there and say maybe I should have you know mm -hmm. you know played that game because between them is this mountain and, and that mountain can take them to a really great level of wisdom um, 
Then we have that, that mysterious angel, which really is, is saying to just trust. You just want to trust that the right things are there, that it will work as long as you say that this, you know, you put that in there. This is going to work. Um, so this card is not about romance at all. It's really about choices and how to handle choices, how to make them, how to just, you know, if need be, flip a coin or do a tarot reading or something, but <laughs> but don't argue over who's got the better option. Mm -hmm. So the lover's card is, um, it's, a, it's a neat card. And I was talking to someone this morning, I said that the decks that deprive me of, the, of these cards or decks that will get rid of the bad cards and make mm -hmm. them all nice and honey-coated, I won't use those. And you know, I want a deck that's honest and, and has all the potentials of reality in it. We have now card number seven. Seven is called the Chariot. And we see a character sitting or standing, can't really tell, in a chariot. There's a canopy over the top. Um, it's a good sized one. It's got great big wheels. And for locomotion, it's got a pair of sphinxes that are pulling it. One's black and one's white. But they're sort of sitting there. Nothing's moving forward right now. Mm -hmm. um, the chariot has lots of symbols on it. The figure in the chariot, probably a man, we would assume, mm -hmm. um, has a, a sort of like a, a belt around his waist loosely. Might have like a scabbard hanging from it. And then there's the skirting on the, on the armor. And on that we see magical and alchemy symbols all over everything. Um, he's got a crown with a great big multi-pointed star. The fabric on the th top of the, the canopy over the over his head is got, has stars on it. He's got a staff. There's uh, wings. There's all sorts of symbols all over the chariot. Behind the chariot, a body of water, a large river. Okay. And behind that, an urban area. He's leaving the urban area. And I say urban um, because there are many cards that have what would be an, a more urban area because this one has towers and many buildings and so you see that it's not just a home. Mm -hmm. um, it's where people live so that he would have family and friends and things like that. And this card says that no matter what, you have what it takes, even though part of you wants to be there where it's secure, you have everything it needs to be able to strike out on your own, and you have to. You have to be, what, what's going to move the chariot, though, is his own will, his desire, his need to go out into the world and, and propel himself. And then the black and the white, those polarities. So he's got to balance, so many of the cards are about balancing polarities. So in this card, the chariot itself is, is, is what moves it forward is the balance between polarities. Um, it's a nice card. I like this one. This card is um, Cancer when we, if we deal with the astrological um, parts mm -hmm. that go with it. I'm, I'm not going to go into all of those mm, right, right now. Right. Yeah, right. I'll be good here. Let's see. That's card number seven. Card number eight is strength. Yes. And here we have an image of a of a lovely young lady wearing a beautiful, gentle white robe. So she might be like a priestess or a novice. She has a crown of flowers on her head and our good old infinity symbol is now she's got it. So we know that she has her energy in really good shape. Mm -hmm. And she's manifesting this good energy up above her head. But she's busy. She's occupied. She is um, caressing a lion who's standing next to her. She has her hand on the top of his head. And the other hand is caressing his jaw, sort of like you might do with a house cat. Mm -hmm. And the lion is licking her hand. Um, in the background, we have the mountain and vegetation, trees, things. So we know that 
This card can be fruitful and it can lead to the top of the mountain. Now, mm -hmm. the lion represents the raw animal type energy that we have. Um, that primal, non-human energy. And she represents the pure, sublime, spiritual. Okay. And so it's a balance between the as above and the below. The raw primal, and, and she represents patience and that sublime spiritual energy. She has tamed a lion through her patience and her spiritual energy. And because of that, they work well together. She's not afraid of the lion. The lion licks her hand. Um, this card says that you have to have both. You have to have raw, brute strength, and you have to have pure, gentle, spiritual strength. And they have to work together. Neither one works well alone, right. um, and you won't reach the top of the mountain. And they just, they, they look very content together. It's really a lovely card. Card number eight. Card number nine one that I've related to for a long time because this is the hermit. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this has been my one of my cards, probably the strongest one for me over the years. The hermit is up, well, we see at the level, at the bottom of his card, the tops of a mountain range. And he's standing on, the, on what looks like a little tiny peak, just a little plateau. So he's up, way up in the, in the mountains. Mm -hmm. He has a staff, he's got a robe on that's got a hood, and he's holding a lantern in the other hand. And in that lantern, there's a six-pointed star radiating light. So the six-pointed star is always interesting because that is, um, it, it has lots of magical things. Um, my favorite way to interpret that is if you superimpose the four triangles over each other for the four elements, mm -hmm. you'd get the six-pointed star, which shows that everything is there in perfect balance and magic is manifesting. Um, so in the lantern represents all the wisdom and experience and enlightenment that he has. Now, so many people when they're, <coughs> excuse me, on the path to becoming teachers, they're saying, look at me. I've learned so much. But he's not saying that at all. He's saying, look at the wisdom. You know, I can help you get there. Mm -hmm. But what really matters is the light, not the person who's holding it. Oh. And so this card represents some of the best things about being a teacher because it says, yes, you can guide people, but it's not about you. You have to make right. the light what's the most important. Um, and he is shown as someone who's old, who has a lot of experience, who's done everything it takes to get to the point of having that type of wisdom. Um, it's a nice card, very simple, very clear sky in the background. His head is sort of slightly bowed. He's very humble. Uh, there's just a, I like this card a lot. Card number 10 has a lot of complexity. We've been dealing with these nice simple images of people and mm -hmm. scenarios. And now what we have is, um, oh, it's just a bunch of stuff, but I'm thinking of describing it. In the center of the card is a round wheel. Mm. Before I tell you what's on it, Immediately around it are three beings. Mm -hmm. um, sitting on top, we have a sphinx who's sitting upright on its haunches, holding a sword. On the right-hand side, almost lower right, but medium to lower, mm -hmm. there's a serpent. On the um, other side is... A, a jackal could be like Anubis. Mm -hmm. 
in the four corners of the card, against each one against clouds, we have um, four winged beings. There is for the ele for the elements of earth. There's a, a a steer or a bull. There's a lion for the elements of fire. Um, a bird for the elements of air, and a human for something. Um, I, they, so they represent the basic four, although not the way we often think of them. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> On the card, <laughs> we have the letters T-A-R-O, and then a T. There's one in each of the four directions. Mm -hmm. So again, this could be, it could be tarot, or tarot like the root without the T. Um, it could be rota. Um, in between the four letters, there are some he Hebrew characters and some magical symbols on the things in the wheel. And so there's a lot of complexity on this card. And it shows that the wheel uh, is going around and around and there's a lot of change taking place. There's a lot of flux. There's a lot of activity. Things are shifting. And like on a merry-go-round, the best thing you can do is be at the center where you can see everything clearly. Mm -hmm. Because if you're out at the perimeter, caught up in detail, everything's whizzing by really fast. Right. One of the, the phrases that my teacher, a lovely woman named Judy, said, is seek the still center. So, yeah. Don't worry so much about the brass ring because if you're out of the edge, you're going to miss it all the time. You have to seek the still center. Um, thanks to Wheel of Fortune on television, <laughs> this, <laughs> this card, it's difficult for this card to come up without hearing that voice of the whole audience going, Wheel of Fortune, you know. But it's a great card. It's a card that represents that the potential is there for good change and opportunity, but you have to be able to be paying attention to what's going on. Mm -hmm. You have to be looking at the potential rather than caught up in all the flux, all the detail, because when, you, when that happens, then you don't really see the larger pattern. And this card wants you to have that larger pattern. Ready for the next one? Ready. Okay. Card number 11, Justice. Very much like the priestess, except a little bit less ornate. Now we see a woman sitting on another bench. Mm -hmm. you know, anytime you have a character seated on a bench in the tarot, that means that they have some prominence in the community. Okay. Seated between two pillars um, and behind a piece of fabric hanging up. This time there's nothing on the fabric, but again it's blocking the future. The future's unknown when we go to seek justice. Justice is holding um, balanced scales in one hand. And in the other hand, a very large sword. That sword, well, let's see, that sword, if we were to look at it up close, would be um, based on the size of the figure. If you're sitting in a chair, it would probably be chest high, um, maybe shoulder high. I mean, it's a big sword. And Justice is holding it out there in... Oh. Yeah, yes, with the arm extended. So that means justice is very strong. Not only is the justice on the throne, but there's a platform, it's raised, so that where the people come is down, down one step and then justice is up there. Mm -hmm. um, justice means then you, you want to evaluate the facts you don't know what the outcome will be, but you put things in the hand of, of some deciding factor or person who will make a decision. And you have to accept the fact that, um, how did she say that? Justice is not always fair, but it is always just. Something like that, you know. Um, it's, it's funny. It's a karma type card because it's usually connected 
to getting what you deserve. Not always a good thing. Yeah. <laughs> but um, it's it's good. The next card we have is the Hanged Man. And the Hanged Man is, is a figure who has the, the things that have been done off the card, like off stage, is he's put his life in order so that he's got time, maybe a week or two, to put everything in suspension. Um, he is now hanging from a fertile tree, even though it's shaped like a T. It's got lots of green leaves and bunches of leaves, so we know that it's a fertile tree. And he has tied a rope around one ankle, and that's attached to this cross. Mm -hmm. And he's hanging upside down. Okay. With one leg, the, the other leg is bent, so that it's like a number four. At his head, down toward the ground, where the hair is hanging down also, we see lots of radiance from the head. And that's what this card is about. It's about putting your life on hold so that you have time to evaluate your belief system. Really time to contemplate about what you really believe in. Where do you really want your future to take you? Um, and it's, it's a very... It's something we don't do a lot. Mm -hmm. Today, people, when they try to meditate or, or, or a serious prolonged couple of days, you know, they, they're still taking email, they're still answering their phone. <laughs> that stuff's going on. But this is somebody who had the wisdom to put everything in suspension. And the position hanging upside down, it's like, remember those inversion boots? Yes. This is very similar to that. It's like a type of, like a yoga pose. So that the blood will flow to the head, the head is perhaps closer to physical reality. Um, there are lots of things about it that we're not sure exactly which way to read the symbols. But it's a pretty simple card. Very important card. After the hanged man, death. Death is in black armor, uh -huh. riding a beautiful white horse. You know, white horse is mm -hmm. pretty sensual. Um, that's holding a, a, a staff with a large banner on it that's like a white rose. And um, it's interesting looking at the card. The At death's feet, at the horse's feet, there's one figure laying down prone. Uh, there's some people praying, sobbing. There's the, the um, clergy person who is conducting the ritual who looks like at least a bitch, bishop because of the, what he's got on his head. And off in the distance we see a sailing boat on the water. Mm. So on the other side of the water, a pretty good sized cliff and at the top of the cliff there are two pillars two towers mm -hmm. and between them the Sun is rising huh so this card says it's about death but mostly this card is about the resurrection that follows death a new day the next day you know mm -hmm. a new beginning things like that. It's a reminder that that's an option. Um, and sometimes when you make a big enough change, you have to leave people behind. Um, sometimes even family. Sometimes things happen to them. Um, they might be sick. They might be more than sick. Um, this particular deck does not, it doesn't start out saying your, your mother's going to be in the hospital. You know, but somebody who's really talented with the cards could translate that and bring that out. Um, card number 14. Card number 14. There are some things about this card that just intrigue me. But we, we've got an angel type being um, standing with one foot in the water. And that's the foot that should be bearing the person's weight. 
the um, posture, you know, mm -hmm. the, the, the foot that's on land is sort of off to the side um, and not underneath where the center of gravity would be. The figures wearing a white robe, great big wings, really big wings. And between the two chalices, there's water flowing in both directions. Or wine, or whatever, mm -hmm. we don't know. Um, and then on one side, there are um, irises, like the big yellow flags. And on the other side, there's a path that leads off into the distance where there are tall mountains mm -hmm. and the sun. Um, this is not a card that says you've got time to go take that path right now, but you need to remember where it's where it is, how to get there, how to make it happen. Um, it's an interesting card because it's full of potential. This card doesn't turn up unless it believes that you know what you're talking about. And oh, one more thing, above the the um, two peaks on the top of the mountains, um, there is a card. Uh, that uh, I'm, I'm sorry, not a card. The this symbol at the top of the mountain, over it, like the mountain pass, it it's sort of the sun, but it's like an oval. The only time I can ever think of something that would cause the sun to look oval shaped is an eclipse. Mm -hmm. um, having an eclipse certainly amplifies the card, and those are times when society itself goes a little bonkers because all the energy is stronger, people are less certain about what this all means um, you know, but there's magic out there and people are going mm, I'm not so sure about this now but that's card number 14 temperance, um, temperance is the ability to make the liquid flow in both directions at the same time, like a grand science experience then we have card 15. This is one. Um, this is not a great card. <laughs> this is one of those cards that leads to the troll being misunderstood. Okay. The devil. Ah. Yeah. Um, if you were able to see better, you would see that, that we've got a man and a woman standing on either side of a block. Um, there's a wrapped together uh, around their necks there's a chain that leads to a large ring and a pedestal and the devil is perched on top of that now the chain around their necks is so loose all they'd have to do is lift it up mm -hmm. and they're free um, it's something that people forget when they see the card you know, it's assumed that they're that they're trapped, but they're not. The devil card says that um, there's a phrase that I can remember from years ago in literature: "Be devil in yourself." Mm -hmm. That's what this card is really about. You've turned something into a devil. You're worshiping something that you shouldn't be worshiping. Um, this card can be talking about the value of money in your life, mm -hmm. or hanging on to a title too much, things like that. And it says, oh, maybe you need to let go. Maybe you need to find out what it's like without this. Hmm. And we have another one of those cards. <laughs> the tower. So the tower, we see um, several figures either leaping or thrown from the tower. They're in midair. They've got a ways to go before they land. Um, hopefully the new music will be ready by then. <laughs> it's uh, been ready for a couple of a couple of days, literally, in terms of where I've been at with the tarot cards. Um, but I don't have the, have the music that I ordered to go with one of the decks that I, or I ordered, I think about four or five more decks. <laughs> wow. Well, I just had a long discussion and they were intriguing. So the, the image on the card, we have a tall, tall tower. Mm -hmm. And the lightning has come and struck the tower so that the, the dome has been knocked loose. There's flame, there are, there are flames, flames yeah. coming out of the windows. 
smoke it's in the air and the two figures who got knocked loose are likely to um, be working together before long that would be interesting so I think through the tower let me pause at this point and, mm -hmm. um, and then we'll continue in a bit yeah yeah 